Hi, I'm a, I'm a partner at TRM. I'm leading capital projects for Europe, Middle East, and Africa. I'm physically based in Madrid, Spain, and hence I spend part of my time on renewable energy opportunities in Southern Europe. I will be your moderator in this webinar today, focused on floating offshore wind, an opportunity for Southern Europe. Next slide, please. A few house rules. Uh, we encourage everyone to be active during our webinars. And for that, you can share your questions using the Q&A function located at the bottom right of your screen. You can use the chat box in case you have IT problems. Please note, we are recording the webinar and we will share the presentation to all attendants after its completion. Next slide, please. So what are we going to cover in this webinar? I will start with a short introduction, including a brief health and safety moment. Then Carolina de Mas, Associate Director at RCG, will give an overview of the market in Spain, Italy, and France, and how it will shape floating winds future. Next, Dan Kyle Sperman, Director at RCG, will provide a look at the opportunities that this emerging renewable energy technology brings. And last but not least, François Berry, Principal Consultant at TRM, will talk about sustainability implications of floating offshore wind. We will also try to have time to pick up some questions that may come from the audience. Next slide, please. For those of you who do not know us, ERM is the largest pure play sustainability consultancy. With over 5,000 employees global-wide, we put sustainability at the very center of what we do, and we are committed to building a sustainable future with our clients and other leading organizations. Last year, we celebrated our 50th anniversary. We have projects in more than 170 countries and have ranked in 2022 as a leader in the ESG sustainability consultancy industry by Verdantix. Next slide, please. Our goal is to position ERM as one of the world's leading advisor in the renewable sector. We are delivering this webinar today together with RCG. RCG Renewables Consulting Group is 100% owned by ERM. With ERM's existing renewables activity combined with our recent acquisitions of RCG and Arcus, we bring an innovative, well-respected and responsive team experience in the delivery of re renewable energy projects. We bring deep experience focused on technical and commercial services driven through RCG to support clients early in the project life cycle, development support, including environmental permitting and ESG services, as well as additive and energy capabilities, including green hydrogen, energy storage, and interconnections. Next slide, please. In ERM, we place health and safety at the top of our priorities, and we normally start our meetings with a health and safety moment. So I'm gonna dedicate a couple of minutes to a very important health and safety topic, health and safety in the offshore wind industry. Next slide, please. Of course, we are all aware of the critical role that wind, and especially offshore wind, play as we navigate the transition to a low carbon economy. This chart, taken from the Global Wind Energy Council 2021 Market Intelligence Report, illustrates the anticipated growth in installations measured as gigawatts installed capacity between today and 2030 to get to an IPCC compatible scenario by 2050. The growth trajectory continues beyond 2030, of course, and our clients are doubling down on their efforts too. We see this in the opportunities we are chasing and supporting them on. Their sustainability reports, LinkedIn posts and strategies attest to the investments they plan to make. In summary, it is a market that is accelerating rapidly, not just here in EMEA, but in Asia and the Americas too. Next slide, please. But this investment in offshore wind comes at cost, a human cost, with people being injured and harmed whilst at work. Clearly, this is unacceptable, and all stakeholders are working to reduce this harm. The chart shows two safety performance indicators. The first, the blue line, is the total recordable injury frequency rate. This is the frequency per 1 million hours worked that someone is injured at work in the offshore wind sector. It is during construction or operations and is collected by G, an agency comprising representatives from all the main offshore wind developers and operators. 
An injury in this measure covers everything from a cut finger to a broken leg. The lost time, lost time injury frequency rate is another measure presented on the same basis for 1 million hours, but only counts the most serious injuries where people are unable to return to work immediately. So when time is lost. You can see on total recordables, there has been a gradual reduction over the past six years, but little shift in terms of those more serious injuries. You might also think these numbers are low, 3.75 and 1.7 are pretty small numbers, but in the context of the wider energy sector, they are high. In fact, when we compare them to the equivalent measures in the oil and gas sectors, they are five times and eight times higher. In, in simple terms, you're eight times more likely to be seriously injured working on an offshore wind installation than on an oil and gas sector. Next slide, please. And the most recent data paints an alarming picture. In 2020, the last year we have data for, 198 high potential incidents occurred. These are events when it was highly likely a death or life-changing injury could have occurred. We have been involved in offshore wind HSE for decades at many levels and continue to do so. By way of example, the data we are quoting from is provided by G+, who we have been working with on several assignments, including providing information on global health and safety regulations in different offshore wind jurisdictions around the world and ensuring that they are fully aware of the particulars relevant to each. Next slide, please. So I will now hand over to our presenters today. Carolina de Mas is an associate director in RCG based in Spain. She has over 10 years experience in the offshore wind energy sector, having worked across the full life cycle of offshore wind projects. She has held management and technical positions with major Nordic energy developers and operators, and um, is also an expert on site selection and yield optimization, as well as providing technical advisory for due diligence and conducting risk assessments. Tankhal Sperman is a director in RCG based in the UK, where he leads the floating offshore wind team. Tang works closely with public bodies, developers, and the financial sector to develop, de-risk, assess, and support the deployment of commercial scale floating offshore wind projects. Tan has a background in naval architecture with eight years of technical, operational, and commercial experience in floating uh, offshore wind. François Berry is a principal consultant in ERM based in France. François has 12 years experience in the offshore wind sector with previous experience working for large, large utilities and wind and metallocean survey companies. François is currently um, involved in French tender process delivering project management, stakeholder engagement, and environmental risk and mitigation plans. I'm gonna hand over now to Carolina, who's gonna give us an overview of the market in the Southern Europe Big Three, Spain, Italy, and France. Carolina, over to you. Thank you very much, Maria. And good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining. Today, I'll have the pleasure to lead the first discussion on behalf of our team. The plan is to walk you through the three most promising floating offshore wind markets in the short term for the Mediterranean and to understand the opportunities and obstacles to address in order to establish a thriving industry in the region. Next slide, please. First of all, let's set the scene and uh, let's step back to gauge the appetite for floating offshore wind around the globe, where the total disclosed portfolio is beyond 100 gigawatts. We observe that new projects continue to be announced in both uh, mature and emerging markets as more developers look to position themselves for future leasing rounds and framework announcements are being made. However, note that there is very limited capacity already installed. It's only around 120 megawatts. On the right, we can see how the Mediterranean region ranks on a global scale with Italy, Spain and France positioned in the top 15 having each uh, a multi-gigawatt pipeline. And despite, despite having considerable amount of projects with a route to market secured, France actually ranks lower than Spain and Italy, which is due to the current open door approach to new projects of these two countries. And to be able to share, you, uh, to share with you these insights, we've used our GRIP data hub, 
which is maintained by our in-house market intelligence team on a daily basis. Next slide, please. Then let's start with the least mature market of the three, that's Spain. Spain currently enjoys a healthy penetration of renewable projects in the electricity mix, with even higher ambitions towards 2030 as set out in their energy and climate plans. So far, uh, the country has had an open door approach to offshore wind projects, as said, whereby developers have freely picked locations and submitted requests under the umbrella of the specific royal decree. However, the government has never launched a tender call and by now this regulatory framework is considered obsolete. Having said that and looking ahead, there is a list of very encouraging signs for the market in the short to mid term. Uh, first of all, uh, Spain now has a national vision for offshore wind with targets of one to three gigawatts by 2030, as announced in the roadmap, which was published last December. Second, uh, the Spanish Maritime Spatial Plans, known as POEM, are expected to be published in spring, and they've been through a public consultation process and, among others, identify areas with priority for offshore wind deployment, with a potential for more than seven gigawatts. Also, there are strong indications that the regulatory framework will be revised this year, which could lead to a first commercial uh, scale auction by the end of 2023, hopefully. And then the tender scheme itself is not clear yet, but it could potentially be a single competition awarding CVET lease rights, revenue support, and point of interconnection. Next slide, please. Then we can now move to, to Italy. And as a new member state, uh, Italy also has ambitious targets and commitments to reach carbon neutrality in the upcoming decades. In terms of offshore wind, Italy has its first project under construction, that's the 30 megawatt Taranto farm in the Apulia region with, uh, with fixed technology. And um, the market was uh, relatively dormant until 2019, but by 2020, up to five gigawatts of combined project capacity were disclosed to be under development. And only half a year later, the Italian TSO, Terna, announced that more than 17 gigawatts of projects had requested grid application. The regulatory framework is well established in Italy and the permitting procedure consists of three main milestones. Uh, one of them is the granting of the maritime domain concession. Then is the conduction and approval of the EIA uh, compatibility. And finally is the obtention of the single authorization or autorizzazione unica, which culminates the consenting process. And off-take auctions will be held under the fair to decree once this one is approved. Next slide, please. Uh, Carolina, can I, can I make a question before you continue? So could you tell us, you're mentioning the fair decree 2022, could you tell us a bit more about that and how, if, if it has already been approved? Uh, sure, so the fair to decree, uh, there's, a, there's a draft uh, published and is expected to be approved this year. And maybe the highlights would be that the draft includes the incentive tariffs for offshore wind in the order of 165 euros per megawatt hour. And this should be granted through competitive bidding rounds. And also worth mentioning that the total power quota for offshore wind from now up to 2026 is around 3.5 gigawatts. So definitely ambitious. Okay, thank you. And uh, yeah, thank you. Lastly, let's, let's have a quick look at France as well. The country awarded the first project sites as early as 2012 and has now a few projects under construction in the Atlantic coast, actually, with fixed <coughs> technology. And additionally, uh, last week, the offshore wind pact, uh, the pact de l'éolienne en mer, apologies with, for my French, um, um, was signed, uh, whereby the country sets a very ambitious target of 18 gigawatts by 2035. And with regards to the tendering mechanism, uh, France has a well-established tradition to run thorough public consultation processes to seek for the consensus on development areas for offshore wind. And once these have been agreed, then competitive tenders are then and are launched for seed at least combined with revenue support. And these are known as appel d'offre or AO, uh, followed by the correspondent number of the call. And note that this, uh, this market, the French TSO, will lead and own the transmission system to shore. 
And currently there are two open tenders for floating offshore wind technology. We have the AO5 targeting uh, one site of 250 megabytes in Southern Brittany and the AO6 targeting two sites, 250 megas each in the Mediterranean, as you can see on the map. And additionally, France has launched four pilot farms for floating technology, one in the Atlantic and three in the Met. Next slide, please. And since we're at France and uh, speaking about the Met, uh, news from last week tell us that consensus has been reached for one of the AO6 areas, that's area number one on the map, with the second area to be confirmed pending further studies on avifauna. And an alternative zone, number three, has already been identified. Next slide, please. So with a market volume to reach multi multiple gigawatts in the Mediterranean in the coming decades, um, further supply chain investments for local manufacture of major components will be required. Additionally, ports are also a vital part of the supply and logistics chains that's needed for the installation, assembly, operations, and maintenance, and eventually the commissioning of all these farms. And also note that ports uh, are also expected to pay, play a significant role in upscaling the Europe's renewable hydrogen infrastructure. On this map, we're showing locations with known supply chain capabilities and potential staging ports for floating offshore wind in the future with the right investments. And the list is live and expected to further grow with more partnerships and MOUs being signed. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, however, there are going to be challenges to find and mature areas for offshore wind in the Met. We understand that running a thorough risk return exercise to screen exploration areas is key to maximize the commercial value on one hand, and on the other hand, to reduce permitting risks down the line. So as to minimize risks, we need to ensure safe coexistence with all the sea users, while also bearing in mind commercial, social, and political considerations among others. And my colleague Francois will tap on some of the most pressing environmental and social considerations later in the session. A handful of these constraints are displayed on the map, to give you a sense on how much this might reduce potential development areas and why many developers seek to position themselves in emerging markets as soon as possible. Next slide, please. Carolina, one question um, before you move on. Um, so you talked about the risk return assessment of areas suitable for offshore wind. Is this still relevant in, in area selection when area selections are led by the government? Yeah, um, in a given tender call, the areas announced are normally rather lar large and prospective developers are expected to find the most suitable site uh, location within those areas. And additionally, governments might open up several areas in the same poll. So one needs to understand how they compare to each other and, you know, before taking a decision for their bit or bits strategy. Okay. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. Yeah, so to start wrapping up, um, based on the large amount of variables that shall be accounted for an optimal site selection, we've developed a holistic approach for site characterization called Realize, uh, and which has four main steps. First of all, we start by a full uh, value framework assessment, which is basically an objective data collection exercise and includes understanding of the resource, as you can see on the left, the physical and human environment, authorizations and land, with that we mean cover leasing and permitting considerations. Interconnection and sales, uh, they help us understand route to market, offtake mechanisms and potential revenue support. And finally, engineering considerations, such as the energy supply chain and, and ports and general site conditions. So that's the very first step. Then discipline experts will brainstorm to identify potential project areas based on this data analysis. And we strongly believe that human factor and the discussions in the room are a key milestone to progress at this stage. Then we move to a more automated process whereby LCOE analysis and risk assessments are executed for each of the identified areas to understand how they compare, each, each site compares to each other. And finally, the optimal site selection will depend on developers' uh, risk appetite and internal strategy. So whatever the choice is, it will be based on a deep understanding of the project development risks and the attractiveness of the potential zone. 
Next slide. Thank you, um, Carolina, for this great overview of these three very promising markets. Uh, next, we are going to hand over to Dan Kalsperma, who's going to talk a little bit about the opportunities afforded by the floating offshore wind technology. Over to you, uh, Dan Kyle. Good afternoon, and thank, thank you, Maria. If we can move to the next slide, and as you said, I, <clears throat> we take a, a step back a little bit uh, in terms of, well, what, why is it we're looking at floating offshore wind? Um, what you see here are the areas in red are the, the areas suited to fixed bottom. So here defined as uh, up to 60 meters of water depth. And the areas in blue, the floating foundation areas, so deeper than 60 meters. Of course, in reality, there is a, it's a bit of a gray area between the two. But what, what you can see is that there is significant opportunity globally uh, in those deeper waters. And um, although it looks quite small, the blue areas in the southern, southern Europe, as this is a global scale, they are actually quite significant um, potential areas. So what floating wind allow, enables us to do is actually to go into those deeper water areas. So if we can go on to the next slide, um, and as mentioned in Southern Europe, particularly those, the, the, there are those deeper waters. Um, as Carolina mentioned, there, at this stage of, of floating wind, there is uh, just over 120 megawatts operational um installed on a, just over 20 platforms so we, we're seeing some quite significant numbers in terms of capacity however there's some certain phases of development that needs to happen in order to to unlock those opportunities so what we've broken down here are some some categories of of uh, projects or size of projects as it as it um, we expect them to deploy and the expected years I should say this isn't a precise science, but it's the, the stepping stone towards the, the future commercial projects. So what we see currently um, that are being deployed are the demonstration and pilot projects. So demonstration is, is what it says on the tin. It's demonstrating the technology works um, for using essentially fixed bottom turbines on a floating platform ensuring there's no issues with availability or yield and to test the, the operations and various um, approaches to, to, to understand before then stepping to the, the pilot phase, which is happening a little bit in parallel. And you can see with a couple of projects in Portugal, um, Scotland and uh, coming up in Norway. And what this is, is, is stepping up, looking at a small array of projects and again, again really building up the confidence and knowledge um, of slightly larger projects. And you can also start looking at different um, financial um, or more, more attractive financial options for, for funding. And you can start looking at, at it from an offtake perspective in terms of the funding mechanism rather than just being purely grant funded. And also understanding you start becoming not, you know, we wouldn't say maybe full commercial, but from a, a business proposition, proposition, it's a commercial project, um, looking at returns, and that really then gives you confidence to move into what we call a small commercial scale, so up to about 200 megawatts. And this is very much then you would expect to see significant cost reduction happening um, as you scale up. So a lot of the costs relating to the development would uh, would not scale. So it would stay the same for, even for pilot and small commercial. And of course, but you have a large, uh, larger um, revenue or, or offtake. And much more competitive options, uh, competitive financing options. And again, this is a big confidence building to then step up. We quite often see these small commercial projects called the stepping stone projects. And then this would then step into your, your kind of full commercial. We say kind of about 200 megawatts, but in reality, that will scale up very quickly to, to drive those, those costs, costs down. And then in terms of the kind of how this sits in terms of overall deployment, if you Look at the next slide. We tried to uh, explain. So this is carbon trust numbers in terms of you know, kind of a, from an industry perspective where build out is expected, and this is just overlaying then where we'd expect, expect to see those project sizes. Of a particular note is that you can build all the demonstration projects you want, but really you're not going to add capacity. But it's when those small commercial and particularly the the larger commercial projects come online that's going to really increase rapidly the, um, the capacity. 
And where we expect to see the, the initial big drivers are both in Europe and in Asia. So as Carolina kind of mentioned, the specific markets, we see those Southern Europe, as well as some of the Northern Europe, like Scotland and Norway, as also as being, being those, those drivers. And you can see the, the uptick happening around 2030. Um, and the reason for, for 2030 is there's a lot of projects that scale up and there's a big focus around that area. Um, and as, as, you know, essentially as the market has confidence in the technology um, investors, yeah, that's where we expect it to come together and see that that significant uptick. Uh, of course, the further you go go on, it becomes more challenging to um, to, to estimate what the pipeline is going to be because you're relying on these stepping stones having been successful in order to to either increase the capacity or decrease if it's taking longer. So it's it's very much a stepping stone approach to that. If we, if we look at the next slide. Um, so uh, one of the biggest um, focuses is on cost reduction, um, understandably, because what we're looking for from an industry is to be cost competitive with other forms of renewable generation, or indeed generation, electricity generation, full, full stop. Um, and in order for, for that, the, the kind of key drivers are, are as I mentioned, deployment. When you start off, it's a bit of a catch-22 because you need deployment to get cost reduction. So there is, there is that requiring a certain amount of government support. But when we see deployment increasing, that's where we expect costs to come down quite significantly. And in fact, at a faster rate than, than we would have seen for fixed bottom based on the learnings we've had from, from the, the offshore wind industry. And uh, so some of the other critical areas would be the supply chain development. So as you go into the, the existing or to new regions, supply chain requirements are different for, for flooding wind. And as the projects scale, the, the, the pie or the opportunity becomes larger and they can invest into that and then um, build out efficiencies and industrialization to, to supply them. And, then, and of course, similar to fixed bottom, the continued growth of turbines is important in driving the cost down. Effectively, your tons of steel per megawatt reduces the larger your platform is and it's even more favorable for floating wind than for fixed bottom so you're going to really see floating going to to the upper end of the turbine prices. and finally the what, what we've seen really driving costs in fixed bottom will be the same in floating and that's the competitive processes and tenders noting of course what i said is kind of a balance between as you scale providing sufficient funding to, to, to step up in size and reduce cost, um, but and bringing in the competition as you go on to more commercial. But that would be quite critical in, in bringing down for those larger projects or as the projects increase in size. So as an example on the right, you can see the, the, the hatched light blue. These are the, um, the, the ceilings or the cap for uh, the two upcoming French tenders. Um, although we would expect the prices to be significantly under the cap. So that's where the, the dashed line is, where we would expect circa 80 euros or definitely under 100 euros per megawatt hours for those 250 megawatt projects. And on the next slide. So just trying to, to summarize some of the key advantages we see uh, in floating, particularly compared to, to uh, fixed bottom. As I mentioned, it unlocks those, those deeper waters, which would be inaccessible to the bottom and, and linking this and Francois will build in some more of the, the consenting uh, afterwards but it does support um, or easing of consenting based on moving to areas with lower for example lower densities but also as Francois will talk about it does drive some other elements and um, it reduces your intensity uh, as you're piling smaller um, smaller foundations in for your anchoring systems than you would see for your particularly for your very large uh, monopiles. Um, your installation vessels, one, uh, one of the kind of particular challenges with fixed bottom is when you go to the bigger turbines is the very limited and expensive vessels for, for um, undertaking the installation, the, the jack-up vessels. Um, going to floating enables you to use different vessels um, not, and you don't need to do the lifting requirements. You can do more work onshore. 
particularly in the construction phase. The components themselves are more standardized. So you can have designs for, for projects or designs for even for areas. And essentially your supply chain can just roll out those modular components to, to, to lots and lots of different fields, um, which enables the serial production. And also we see synergies in deep water industries such as shipping, oil and gas, and other renewables like wave, tidal. Um, so the location of these projects uh, can fit very well with the other, other potential business models and offtakes that, that would already exist. However, on, on, on the flip side, as there is always, we do see some, some risks um, to these. So on the next slide, we give an overview of where we would see some of these risks. So kind of moderating those benefits, the, so one being grid connection. And um, as we go to the more remote areas, it does mean there is tending to be less population. No, no, this isn't always the case, it, does, it is very dependent, but then you're requiring the infrastructure to bring the power back to where, where it's required. And as I mentioned, uh, the advantage with the, the, the jack-up vessels and the not requiring them, what it does do, it, if you're doing more construction work onshore, that creates a bottleneck on the infrastructure that's required onshore. So looking to you know, do some alternative methods if there's uh, too much traffic in your port or other competition from, from other users. And we see on the subsea side, a lot of um, components that are very familiar from oil and gas, um, however, new loads and dynamics being applied to those, you know, particularly with uh, floating winds, very large, your, your top side is very large compared to your platform, relatively speaking, compared to oil and gas. And that has a different effect. And of course, when we're talking cost, um, the very different margins. Um, in terms of the platform consolidation, we, we, we are tracking over 100 different floating platform concepts or designs. And really for supply chain and the various industry actors to, to be able to tackle and optimize and have more efficient supply chains, this, this needs to be reduced um, uh, for, for, for kind of cost reduction and to, for them to really be able to tackle uh, the challenges. Uh, from an O&M perspective, um, uh, we see the, the, the light maintenance or day-to-day -day maintenance scheduled being very similar and not some of the challenges. However, on the, the, the larger or uh, replacing your main components, such as blade or gearboxes or powertrain, power um, the requirement for either doing the, the lifts offshore versus bringing the uh, platforms back to shore, there's, there's some challenges and unknowns that exist, exist with that. From a commercial perspective, um, as mentioned, the costs are uh, substantially higher at the moment and coming down but there is a gap that needs to be supported with government subsidies, uh, for example, to, to bridge those and drive the cost down. So there, you know, there's a risk there um, if funding were to drop that it, it could, uh, it, it, it could um, be more challenging to drive further costs down and scaling. And Francois will, will talk more on this, but environmental impacts is an interesting one because you both have pros and cons. Um, we do expect it to be lower, but at this stage there is uh, but quite limited evidence based on just over 120 megawatts being operational. So I think it's really important getting that information that, that is already there to understand and help um, as, we, as we deploy further projects. Um, thank you. That's thank you, Dan question. Kyle. Um, I, I think I have a question for you. What are the biggest risks to the development of commercial scale floating wind uh, projects? Th thank you, Maria. Yeah, I think I think uh, there's quite quite a few there, and um, I, I think critical for me is the um, ensuring the understandings and the lessons learned from both the demonstration and the pilot projects are are learned into those step a few further stepping stone projects, and, and lessons learned to kind of in the wider sense in terms of how to build the projects, as you mentioned, health and safety, kind of taking all those aspects and feeding them into the next generation. So for me, I see the risk is that we don't do that. Um, and the commercial sensitivity stop us sharing that, that information across. Okay. And there are a number of different floating wind concepts in development. How will these concepts be consolidated? Yes, thank you. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, a, very, it's a very good question. Um, 
And I think um, it's going to be a combination of as we go to the uh, to the demonstration and pilot phases, um, the, the, the kind of long list being squeezed to a short list. And then as we see them being being built and kind of single or multiple units, um, really understanding how it is they are, how, how, um, how cost-effective and how they can be manufactured. Um, and how, so once they get to that deployment phase, understanding are they, are they successful projects? And then, and then how reliable are, are the platforms? How are, they, how are they performing to then understand and then go to the, to the larger projects with, with, the, uh, with a, a, a shorter list? Okay, thank you, Dan Kyle, for this great summary. No doubt that floating offshore wind is an exciting phase and with a bright future ahead, but also with some challenges. Sustainability is a key factor to de-risk offshore wind, and we will now hear from Francois about some of the environmental and social implications specific to this technology. Francois, over to you. You are mute, Francois. Yes. Thank you, Maya. In these presentations, I want to share general ideas to support floating offshore development and more specifically uh, regarding environmental impacts. So next slide, please. So we all know that global change is a main risk for marine environment and biodiversity. Acidification, extreme events are serious threats for all species. And we believe that renewable energy is part of the solutions, but this project needs also to consider local and regional environmental impact. So in these presentations, we made a, a comparison between fixed and floating projects, and uh, we identified that on some aspect, it could really help to reduce risk, but on other aspects, it could generate different impacts, and these differences need new approaches to there is floating offshore wind and make it more sustainable. Next slide, please. So floating foundation is a great opportunity, and I think we will all, all agree here uh, for Southern Europe. It could be placed in water uh, in 100, 200, and maybe uh, in any future up to 1,000 meters. But, uh, and you can see this 1,000 uh, meter line in green. And these technical constraints give more flexibility to identify new projects. But as Carolina said, Mediterranean is getting busy. And we need to consider social risk and stakeholders. For instance, tourism. Southern Europe is representing 400 million tourists a year, mostly interesting in the seaside. And definitely, uh, there is a concern with the landscape impact. In France, project uh, area uh, are located at 20 kilometers from shore. So I think we are OK. But on other areas, it will be not the case. I'm thinking about uh, Canaries Island, with very uh, touristic area. So it's something to be addressed. Marine traffic, uh, Mediterranean Sea represents 20% of global traffic. And again, connected with tourism, it's also 200 million passengers per year. So again, very, um, very hot topics for, for the Mediterranean Sea and, and South Atlantic. We have also to consider radar, sea level aviations, defense. Fishery areas are also uh, very uh, important in, the, in this uh, area. And as you will see in the map just below, uh, we have also uncertainties regarding boundaries, specifically on the exclusive economical zone. And you will see uh, on the map uh, Algeria. Uh, definition Spanish uh, exclusive zone in France. And it seems that uh, all these three countries are not totally in line on what uh, this exclusive zone should be. So it's something to be addressed. Um, and, um, and yes, it's, a, it's a definitely a concern. Next slide, please. Now, if we are looking at the environmental impact, uh, as Dankel said, uh, the, I think the big impact on biodiversity is related to installation activities, vessel activities generating noise, pollution, increasing collision for birds and mammals, ground preparations for jacket and gravity base generating turbidity, pile driving strikes, 
can generate noise uh, up to 80 kilometers. Uh, now with floating offshore wind uh, technology, we're really expecting a lower risk regarding vessel activity. Uh, it is expected that floating turbine will be fully assembled on K and then towed to the project site. This can definitely reduce uh, fleet uh, mobilized. Encore systems, um, pile driving is still an option, but it will be with way smaller uh, pile. And we have a lot of alternative drilling and grouting, uh, and also gravity-based drag anchor as an suction pile. I expect it to have very local and limited impact and could be removed at decommissioning, as you, we all know that remediation is also a, a concern. Next slide, please. Now, the most sensitive impact, I think, and Dan can mention it, is regarding um, the seabed impact and the footprint. Uh, the most common mooring solution now is catenary. It's a combination of synthetic rope and heavy chain. Catenary lines are designed to be at least four times longer than the depth of projects. So we expect to have a way part of heavy chains causing abrasion, trenching, and sedimentary suspensions. And these solutions may result to a larger footprint compared to fixed foundation and specifically at commercial scale. Now, that said, it's, we really expect uh, a lot of progress from research and development uh, coming from uh, on the semi tote and tension leg. We really expect to, have, uh, to reduce the footprint and reduce the, the, the impact on seabed. Next slide, please. Impact on seabird. We all agree that uh, it's really uh, whatever the technology, it's, it's a main concern. Um, if we look at the MED, we have a lot of uh, endemic species. And we all know that it's a main corridor for migratory birds going to Africa. So, and as some of you may know, uh, one of the demonstrator projects developed along French coast as is permit cancelled because of risk on the free passes. Uh, mostly Puffin Yelcoin, Puffin de Scopoli, and uh, Stern Kojek. So, birds and biodiversity in general are really critical to secure your permit. Well, now the good point with floating offshore is that seabirds present generally decrease with offshore. offshore. So, it's something that uh, we, we can consider as a good point. And that's why the French government is confident in opening this new zone located further offshore from the project just canceled. On the other hand, there is still uncertainty on migrations. And again, the French government now is uh, launching a dedicated study called Migralion. And we expect uh, output to decide uh, of the uh, final zoning of this uh, Mediterranean French tender. Uh, we also to consider that moving far offshore, uh, seabirds rely on gliding and flat gliding, reducing their capacity to change directions, and uh, fold floating offshore wind structures may serve as an attractant for some species, which is good, but at the end, uh, increasing at the same time collision risk. So again, uh, assessing seabirds uh, impact is really uh, it's a real challenge. We need to study behavior, uh, eight of flight for each species, potentially motion of turbines, and uh, we definitely need more data. Next slide, please. Um, Francois, before you continue, please. Yep. Okay, no, go, go ahead. I'll, I'll make the question in a minute. Let's finish. No it. problem. So regarding the, the reef effect, um, we can really expect to have marine growth development on floating structures that attract fishes and create new habitats. And definitely reef effect is very positive when, when structures are colonized by local species. But uh, attention must be paid on ballast water. And specifically, if you, if you are transferring foundation or work boats from other geographies, again, marine growth could have also negative impact on the wear of structures uh, specifically on electrical cable. Um, another risk is really related to electromagnetic field. And we, 
we, we need more information and specifically on floating substations. Um, and last uh, point, uh, which is rather a new risk, is related to mammals entanglement and specifically in secondary entanglement, where other materials such as fishes, gear, and ropes or plastics become entangled in line. And this materials goes to entangle animal. This is also a risk for navigations and potentially a risk also for a wear and tear of the structures and cable and marine. Hey, Francois, just wanted to yes. make your question. Yes. If you allow me. Um, so you mentioned fishing among the potential social impacts to consider. This is yeah. certainly an important aspect for Southern Europe mm. where the fishing industry is strong. Mm. Can you tell us if there are specific issues related to fishing activities to be taken into account in floating offshore wind? Well, I, I will not say there is any issue related to, to fishing. Uh, I would say that um, to consider really fishing activities, we, we need to, to, to split and to, to make the distinctions between uh, fishing activity using passive gear and using active gear like trawler and uh, as we saw with uh, mammal entanglement, uh, with floating offshore, we expect to have a lot of cable, uh, electrical cable and marine line. And doesn't seem very reasonable to, to, to imagine uh, a trawler inside a, a, a wind farm, uh, a floating wind farm area. That said, uh, there's a lot of uh, tests ongoing with a demonstrator project using passive gear to, uh, let's say, de-risk and to, to test what is possible inside a wind farm or in the vicinity of a project. But again, yes, it's really something we need more, uh, more feedback and more experience. And I know that um, there's a lot of um, tests ongoing. Yeah, thank you, Francois. Well, next there, are, uh, there is also another question on fishing, but I think we're going to pick that up as soon as you finish as well. Good. Uh, just to, 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 as a conclusion, so I would say that uh, floating technology is a great opportunity for Southern Europe. We need to address local specificities and identify dedicated solutions to the risk projects. Um, so, our recommendations, I will say that the first one is obviously to identify low risk areas. And as Carolina said, uh, marine spatial planning is great, but sometimes we need to, 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 to go more into details to further analyze and really to, to, to adapt your, to your project specifications. Uh, the second point is really, uh, it's really important to consider environmental impact in the engineering phase, phases. Uh, it saves time, cost, and potentially at the end, uh, it could save a permit. So for instance, having a good understanding of seabed conditions, benting habitat will help you selecting the best material, anchors and mooring, and so on. So very critical uh, to anticipate that. Um, third point would be, yes, there's a lot of innovations with floating offshore, also on the mitigation measures. Uh, we saw paper uh, of a project developer using specific color on lines to reduce entanglement risk, having blades painted black um, to reduce seabird collisions, uh, automatic detection to, active, uh, to activate a deterrent system is definitely something of interest. Uh, natural inclusive design, uh, such as uh, artificial reef or additional rocks could be uh, uh, bring by developer. And I think that principal power um, is, is proposing something uh, of interest on this aspect for as an example. Uh, last point would be regarding that acquisitions. Um, it is really a challenge for far offshore locations. It could be expensive and associated with safety issues. So we see that more and more having uh, unmanned system using passive acoustic radar for birds and mammals. Um, it's really great because it could be deployed for over a long campaign and it reduces risk for your people and subcontractors. 
The last point I would say that uh, in our approach at ERM, uh, we think that it's also critical to design a survey protocol that can be agreed and aligned with stakeholder and discuss with fishermen, administrations, and environmental impact. This is just a, a few ideas I, I wanted to share with you. Thank you. Over to you, Maya. You're on mute, Maya. Sorry. You're on mute. Sorry for that. <laughs> I said thank you, Francois, uh, for your overview of environmental and social aspects. There are lots of questions coming in, and um, we're going to try to pick up a few of them, uh, additional ones. Uh, apologies to the ones we don't answer, but we will get uh, to everybody uh, after the call uh, to the ones that we have not answered and provide that. I also remind everybody that we will provide the presentation to all the attendants after the webinar. So um, I will start by um, a question for Dan Kyle. Uh, why not mentioning dynamic cables development risks? Can you answer that, Dan? Thanks, Maria. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, I think I think I think it's it's probably due to the the, the relative risk factor. Uh, there's I kind of listed the the major risks, and the, I I think we'd see it as a risk, particularly on the the dynamic export cables. However, the industry is is very much uh, developing uh, various products. So there's there's quite a few suppliers. So there's, there's one supplier where you can get off the shelf array cable, dynamic array cables, and several more coming. Uh, similarly, on the export cables, well, sorry, they're not currently available. The dynamic export cables, but we see them being in development for the mid 2020s, so in the next three to four years. So although definitely now, if you wanted to build a project, it would be an issue. But we kind of see see those uh, developing in line for for the projects. There's also some challenges around installing with the the armoring, but. That's why I guess I didn't mention at this stage. Okay, thank you, uh, Dan Kyle. Um, I'm gonna pick up another one uh, for you, okay? Uh, related to fishing activities, as floating schemes effectively sterilize fishing grounds, has compensation to the fishing industry been included in the costs comparison with fixed bottom? Thanks, Maria. And I guess Francois kind of explained in in one of the questions in terms of the um, you know the actual technicalities of the different gear and you know the what what can and can't be done from a financial perspective. Um, I would say actually probably from a developer side, there's more concern about the consenting risk around it than a financial risk. The financial implication mm. uh, is always worried to say it. <laughs> It would seem to be relatively small compared to to consenting, which is kind of a much more bigger mm -hmm. challenge. So, uh, yes, in, in in short, it is in there, but we would expect that to be relatively speaking small uh, amount when you're considering LCOE. Thank but, you. Uh, sorry, Francois. Yeah, did you want? Yeah, just just to do to add that uh, in France market that I know, um, there, there are. Um, the idea is to, to have also a tax associated to uh, productions. And part of this tax is also uh, will be dedicated to support uh, environmental mitigations, but uh, it could be on the environment, on living environment, but it could be also on the social actions. And it could uh, support investment uh, in uh, fishing activities, research and development, or uh, compensate or help fishermen to change activities or changing their vessel or adapted their, their gear to, to the offshore. So the idea is more to help uh, fishing activity to be more adapted to offshore wind industry. Thank you, Francois. Uh, I have a question for Caroline. I know we have spoken about France, Italy, and Spain, and certainly Portugal is also important for Southern Europe. I have a question here from Mikel Garay. Um, is what about Portugal? Last week, Joao Matos, the Minister of Environment, said Portugal plans to auction three to four gigawatts of floating offshore wind this summer. Could you touch a little bit on that, Carolina? 
Yeah, um, just to say we decided not to include Portugal today uh, as the focus was placed on countries around the Mediterranean region with significant you know, existing activity as you saw on the, on the first uh, ranking list and mostly due to their uh, geographical synergies, right? When discussing supply chain and other issues. But yes, Portugal made this announcement last week that it plans to organize an auction, I believe this summer, a focus on floating offshore wind and up to four gigawatts in pipeline. Uh, we'll closely follow the market as more you know, announcements and informations are being made available. It's definitely big news for the industry. We definitely need governments making bold moves such uh, yeah, France, now Portugal, also Scotland, announcing more commercial scale uh, tenders, uh, which is eventually what will drive uh, the cost down, right? And that's one of the big uh, roadblocks now for uh, floating offshore wind. And I think that tackles one of the other questions I saw from the audience. So yeah, thanks for bringing, bringing it up. Okay. Um, so uh, I think we, we have time for one, for one or two more, and then we will wrap up. Uh, there's here one. Uh, are there floating power hubs planned in the Mediterranean Sea compared to those in the North Sea? Is this something you can answer, Dan Kyle, please? Yeah, no, no problem. Uh, so I assume this is relating to the, there's a North Sea hub where they're looking to build up substations, et cetera. Uh, I, I'd say in short, no. Um, that there's hubs in terms of where there's building activity, but not specifically bringing that into it to one to one unit. I mean, I guess the advantage from a, a shallower perspective is you're building up an island to, to 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 bring in and do all the operations. Whereas because we're in deeper water, there's there's challenges around that. So it's um, bringing it back to land. However, you know, I would say there's probably power to X. There's there's some interesting areas there where you're treating it a bit more like a, um, an oil and gas field. So for example, taking, you know, with Dolphin taking, so ERM's Dolphin, you're taking hydrogen from your platform um, and piping that either uh, to, to, um, to a higher pressure um, pipeline to then bring to shore or to a vessel. So there, there, is, there are areas like that, but not specifically that as far as I'm aware of seeing the, the, the power hubs on this. Caroline and Francois can correct me on that one. No, um, agree. We will, in France, we will have no large hub, but very small hub. Of uh, the idea is to have two zones of uh, 750 megawatt each. So the first stage will be 250, as uh, Karina said, and we will have an extension of 500 in addition for each of the two zones. So it will be definitely smaller hub than we have uh, in the North Sea. Okay, one last question, and I think we need to then wrap up. Is there a limit depth in terms of feasibility to build a fixed bottom substation? In your slides, you mentioned 50 to 60 meters. Is that the limit, CAPEX reasons? And Kyle, perhaps one for you again. Yeah, no, no, no problem. So, so I, I should say 50, 60 is not necessarily a limit, but it's, it's probably, yeah, there's, there's a gray area probably between 50 and 70 meters where everyone fights it out between fixed and floating and different technologies. And actually that, that is for the turbine, the, 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 the substructure for the turbine. When we talk about the substation, actually we consider at least currently deeper waters. So deeper than hundred meters because your cost profile for your substation is very different to a platform because essentially you have a high value asset with your substation that needs to have reliability. So your, your risk profile is completely different. So actually you can easily consider a, a, a 150 meters, maybe even slightly deeper and building a jacket, building that substation on a jacket. So actually your crossover is, is quite different. Um, before you go to a floating substation. Also, floating substations are, are at a completely different level of maturity. So, um, you know, uh, I would say, you know, from a Southern Europe perspective, there's a big focus on, on fixed bottom um, uh, substations, whereas uh, somewhere like the West Coast, or at least for initial projects, whereas West Coast of US will go straight away to floating substations. So they'll probably be driving the, that design. Thank you, Dan, Kyle. I think we are one minute now for the end of the webinar. Well, um, 
please, if I can ask all of you, um, please, uh, can you go to the, to the next? No, we are in that slide already. You can please scan the QR in the screen and respond a few quick questions. It will only take one minute and we will really appreciate it. It will be very valuable for future webinars. Should you have any query, do not hes to hesitate to contact any of the presenters today or else reach out to MA Marketing at erm.com. And thank you all for attending. It has been a pleasure having you all today in this webinar and we wish you all a great afternoon. Goodbye.